and it's the fact mm -hmm. that okay, yes, I got it. Uh, so, so, um, and it's the fact that uh, I have assumed knowledge about machine learning from the audience of, of this seminar. So, so I will use quite a lot of jargon, and uh, the idea is really to try to and interest uh, most people uh, to the topic of quantum machine learning. Um, if you have questions, uh, just let me know. I can answer questions also through the seminar. But if there are questions while I'm speaking, since I'm not sure I could see raised hands and things like that, uh, then Aurora, please. Uh, I, I, yes, I'll, I'll let yeah. you know. OK, so we can do that. So uh, I have. Uh, let, let me get uh, straight away into uh, what I want to show to you, if I find exactly. And I have recognized some colleagues, some, some names, some physicist names in the audience. But I will still go through some introduction of what it is uh, that is today a computing challenge for, for CERN and high energy physics more in general, and how this is connected to what we want to do in this field and what are the steps, I mean, and, 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 and slowly moving towards uh, mo motivating and, and showing to you why we are interested in doing this with quantum computing and quantum machine learning in particular. So I will explain to you what we are doing at CERN. Uh, I will. All, I also have one single slide, two. Okay, two slides in which I discuss uh, some basic concepts of quantum computing. That is absolutely not enough to understand how quantum computing works and what are the all, all of the challenges related to building algorithms that can run on quantum hardware. But I have a list of um, also of resources if you are interested that you can look into uh, to know more. Okay, so. Then we, I move to quantum machine learning, and in particular, what I'm interested in discussing with you are the challenges that are related to building and, and training those kind of models on, on quantum hardware. And now we have also two example applications uh, that, uh, two or three, depending on how much time I have at the end, um, that are nothing special, but I think are, are topics that can relate easily to people in other fields, and so not necessarily from my uh, energy physics, okay? So this is the general idea about this talk. So let me start with a pretty picture, which is uh, meant to explain to you what is it that we're going, or, or tell you more than explain, what we want to do at CERN. Uh, the idea, well, high energy physics is the field that is looking into the, basic, the basics of the interaction and matter so that we can explain the reality around us. And in particular, if you look at this beautiful picture, uh, what we want to explain is, is the empty space, the black part of the picture, which is the, the, the by far the largest part, okay? What is this 95% of the universe we don't yet know how uh, it, it's made uh, of? How does gravity really work? Okay, so there are a lot of different questions that uh, high energy physics is looking for, for an answer to, and we are happy to be one of the main institutes that's contributing to it. So, so we are looking for, for, for explaining, you know, what dark matter is, what dark energy is. Those are expected to be uh, e uh, processes, so events, that are very rare with respect to all of the rest. And it's not just a matter of a proportion of 95% to 5%. We are talking about orders of magnitudes more rare problems with respect to what we call the standard model, so the, 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 the standard matter and interaction that we can fully explain at the moment, okay? And what you see, this very busy plot that you see there on the, on the right shows you, this is not even the latest one, but it shows you more or less of what I mean. What you see on the y, on, on the ax, on the y axis is, uh, is a, a measure of how rare we expect those, those uh, how rare or how abundant we expect the different physics processes to be. And you don't need to know what each one of the dots mean, but what you can look at is, is, is the scale. The fact that this is a log scale and it, it, uh, it scans many, many orders of magnitudes. Okay, so we are looking into very rare processes. Now, those rare processes need to be studied and need to be found with uh, huge detectors. Okay, those detectors, the, you see a picture of the CMS detector. This is not the biggest one in terms of full size. The Atlas detectors is uh, 40 meters tall, but CMS uh, is one of the most dense. In, 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 uh, in, in total, we, we, uh, we are talking about the need to analyze petabytes and petabytes of data. 
So I mentioned CMS. There are actually other experiments that, uh, and, and I mentioned CMS and Atlas. There are other experiments that are uh, paced, that are analyzed the collisions that are generated by the LHC, uh, uh, the, the Large Hadron Collider at CERN. You can see here an impression on how it, it is, uh, where it is placed um, on the border between uh, Switzerland and France, close to Geneva. And um, and how the you know you, you can see the pictures of of, of uh, the different experiments um, at the LHC. Um, so so I'm not going to explain how the experiments work exactly. I think for the sake of the discussion, it's just interesting to clarify a few terms about how the data is actually processed. Uh, so so you can imagine and you can already have an. Uh, you know, you, you can already imagine, and because I said, uh, talked about the size of the detectors and how complex they are, that in fact, you need to combine information that is collected by many different families of sensors that are arranged with different, more or less complex geometries in more in different conditions, with magnetic field, without magnetic field, and so on and so forth. But the point is that you, more or less, you can think of it, or at least uh, you can think of many of those subtasks, so, so, so analysis of, of the output of the sensors of those different parts of detectors as a sort of a image analysis problem. Okay, so indeed many, uh, this is not the topic of the talk today, but many of the ways the machine learning started to be, especially deep learning actually, started to be used in high energy physics was really, really um, through a, um, uh, studying the performance of computer vision algorithms. Okay, so this is a very nice, uh, I would say, connection between between the two fields. Now, uh, what what I, it's interesting. This is a slide, and uh, many different version is always or uh, often shown by people from CERN that need to discuss how the data processing works. I think what's interesting here, just for you to have an idea, that this is a cascade problem, in which there are many different level, many different constraints that change over. <laughs> The change from one step to the other in terms of in terms of the latency, the time that we have at our disposal to solve a problem, so to analyze the data, the size of the data that we analyze at each of the steps, and all of the computing requirements that come with it. For example, one of the the, the, the very initial step is the moment in which we need to decide whether we are going to store a collision, so the, the results of a collision for further processing or not. Okay, this is typically what's called, it's, it's part of the real-time selection, it's also a multi-stage problem, and this is typically called trigger. So this is the trigger, this is the moment in which we analyze the collision, we say, ha, huh, there might be hints for new physics there, let's store this, and we analyze it later on, or, no, this is physics that we know everything about. It's not interesting enough to, to, to be stored at the moment. We need to throw it away, okay? So this moment is crucial because it will actually have a strong impact on the performance of the further step of, of, of the subsequent, I think you say that in English, uh, steps of the analysis. And it's uh, one of the aspects in which actually machine learning has been is being, um, can be more, um, Promising, okay, and it's being tested and implemented by the different experiments. The reason for uh, for uh, let's say this limitation is the fact that we do not have uh, enough computing infrastructure to actually um, process completely all of the data that is produced by the the collision. Okay, so this is where the whole problem of setting up this multi-stage uh, analysis step is is coming from, and even so. You can look at this is not uh, I, I forgot this I I forgot how how all this is plot is okay it's written there 2022 so it's not so old but it's an estimate from one of the experiments about the the way the the requirement in terms of CPU consumption is expected to scale with the new phases of the accelerators and the experiments and so what you see through the years is uh, two two uh, black lines that give you an upper bound, a lower bound on how we expect the computing resources to evolve over time, depending on budget and depending on how we expect technology to evolve. And the colorful lines are an upper bound and lower bound on how our need is going to change depending on the level of R&D that we put in place, okay? And you can see that we are not necessarily, uh, I mean, uh, how can I say, 
uh, we have not yet solve this problem entirely because there are configurations in which for which we already know that uh, we will not have enough enough resources okay so this is clearly in the shaded area below the blue part of the curve okay so so na naturally and i'm not talking about uh, this in detail but uh, when i say r and d this means a lot of things it means improving algorithms that we are already that are already part of the experiments processing uh, strategies writing new algorithms and deep learning, artificial intelligence are among those, so, or, or changing the computing infrastructure entirely. So there are many, many different aspects that physicists are looking into to solve this problem, but this gives you overall the expectation as, as, uh, as estimated some years ago, a couple of years ago, but one of the experiments. So why is that? It's because if you look at how this, uh, this, uh, this, uh, pictures that I said, so this that I mentioned before, so the output of a collision might look like in the next phase of the LHC uh, colli uh, collider. Uh, then we are, we are looking at things that, uh, at, the pr at problems that look like uh, what you see here, whereby at the center of the image, you can expect the point in which the collision happens and all of the purple uh, or cyan here, what is the name of this color, uh, tracks, represent the trajectories of particles that are created that we need to rec uh, reconstruct, we need for which we need to measure the, the parameters, the energy, the momenta, we need to understand what kind of particles they were, okay? So this is a very, very uh, uh, difficult task, as you can imagine, for which we do not have today a full, uh, a full, uh, you know, a, a single uh, solution. Okay, something that can fix or, or can solve all of the different formulations of this problem. And, and why is this, this important? This is another, this is a famous plot that uh, showed how the Atlas experiments uh, arrived at the observation of the Higgs uh, decay into, do, into two photons, a specific way the Higgs particles can, can, can decay. So this is something that, this is the final goal. This is the final plot that an experiment wants to create. Okay, so they need to be able to analyze a lot of events that look very much like what I showed you before, and combine them, and um, uh, combine them across multiple or multiple uh, run, runs of the accelerators, and and make sure that all of the results are consistent uh, with each other until they can get to a meaningful comparison with the theoretical model, and then they can estimate whether they are seeing something new, something that is compatible with the, with the theoretical prediction or not. So why do we want to introduce quantum computing in all of this? Okay, what is it that we expect to gain from trying to throw yet another method that is, I mean, if we want to be precise and honest, it's not even so, I would say, um, stable at the moment into this very complex problem. Well, the idea, this is another, another kind of measurement that has been, maybe it's not as famous as the observation of the Higgs boson, but it's a very, very important for, for in physicists, this is a typical study in which you would, uh, you would analyze how different, many different particles that are produced in a collision are distributed in space. So basically you want to study the correlation, the angular correlation between all the trajectories of your particles, because this can give you an information about the original process that generated the particles, okay? So what is the nature of this original process that generated all these particles? It's quantum mechanics. This is the reason, and you can think it's a quite a long shot, but this is actually the fundamental reason by which, uh, for, for which we are looking into using quantum computers to, or quantum algorithms to solve these kind of problems, okay? We expect or, or we hope to see that an algorithm that runs, that, that follows the principles of quantum mechanics will be better suited to recognize hints or, or remnants of quantum mechanics and quantum field theory interactions um, in the real world, okay? So this is somehow gives you an... Uh, um, uh, the connection, okay? Why do we want to do this with quantum computers? That said, and this is something we can discuss uh, maybe later on, when you talk about quantum machine learning, those algorithms are actually pretty general, okay? They might be 
working the same way, whether you apply them to physics data or you apply them to finance data. And indeed, a lot of people in finance are looking into the same algorithms for, for different reasons, okay? And that triggers a whole discussion, we can get back to it later, about how you define the advantage of using quantum computers with respect to classical, classical models. So just a little bit, this is the this slide that introduces quantum computing. So, so the idea of quantum computing is the fact that you want to translate from a world in with the classical world in which you have a bit of information, classical bit of information that is binary, typically it represents either zero or one value into a, a quantum I'm sorry, I'm hearing something. I don't know if it's a question or no. Okay. So a quantum bit of information that instead exists in a superposition of states. Okay, so at the same time, it's even, it can be in both zero and one. What it means in practical terms, uh, you can, uh, the, the typical example that's uh, used to visualize this is the idea of a spinning coin. Okay, when you have a coin in your hand, you can either see that is a coin that is stopped in your hand, you can either see the zero or the one face. But if you put it spinning, then you will see the two faces overlapping. Basically, you are not able to actually say to see one, uh, the zero or the one until you stop it. And the stopping, the moment you stop it, corresponds in the quantum computing world to the moment in which you measure the qubit state. Okay, so this is a, this is a way of visualizing how this works. And it's a very important point, the point of measuring in the quantum domain, quantum mechanics to say that measuring a quantum state means uh, makes it collapse. That is the moment in which from this superposition of all the possibility of states, you are ending up with one, uh, one specific state. And that is an irreversible uh, step. You cannot go back. Now, in this schema, the, the operations, so the, the, the transformations that would, that would uh, correspond in the classical domain to operations are called gates. Those are unitary transformation. It's because they drive the way a quantum state evolve over evolves over time, okay? So they are, you can imagine, you can represent them as, as unitary matrices that are applied to vectors that represent your qubits, okay? This is the way you build a composition of algorithms, basically compositions of operations mm, that in the, in the quantum jargon are called gates and that are arranged in circuits. You see an example of a circuit in the bottom uh, here, in the bottom part of the slide, where you have a set of qubits that are initialized to some state, a certain number of gates that are applied, and then there is the moment in which the state of the gates of the, of the quantum state, so of the qubit, is measured, and you extract either zero or one uh, from your uh, from your state, okay, from, from the state of the qubit. Uh, there are a few things that you need to be that need to be taken into account, and I will not go into the details. But basically, it's important to understand that there is no one-to-one -one correlation between a classical operation, for example, uh, I don't know, an addition, a multiplication, a division, or whatever, and a quantum gate. If you want to write an algorithm to solve a quantum algorithm to solve a specific problem, you need to rethink it entirely. You, there is very few cases in which you can do a direct one-to-one -one translation from the classical implementation to the quantum. And it makes sense. It's actually better not to try to do that because that somehow is going to limit the performance that you could probably achieve using quantum, quantum computers. Um, one thing that, we, that I would like to point out is that uh, I said this is a technology that is still evolving over time. I think I mentioned this at the beginning. In fact, there is no single uh, solution for, or solution uh, or preferred technology to build qubits. Basically, any technology that you can think of that you can be used to build a quantum state, superconducting, uh, ion traps is the two examples that you see here for ion, from ion Q here uh, and from um, IBM at the bottom, uh, but but even more photon states or or uh, neutral atoms, anything that can be represented as a, as a as a quantum state uh, or can can be can generate a quant uh, relatively stable quantum state 
can be used as as a as a computing platform. Okay, in this in this context. I said, of course, relatively stable because quantum states are not stable. So there is the problem of coherence and this trans of, of a quantum state, and this translates directly in the language of computing in the problem of noise and errors. We initialize, for example, a qubit in a certain state, let's say zero state. There is through the through the in, in time, there is a certain probability that this qubit will flip into another state, into one, for example. And this will induce an error in the calculation in the circuit, OK? So this is the kind of problems. Then there are many more uh, sources of errors, actually. So it's more complicated than what I'm saying now. But this is just for you to have an idea. So this is something that we need to take into account when we write algorithm. And it has an impact on the performance of also of trainable algorithm as algorithms as quantum machine learning. Another thing that I want to point out is that what we are really seeing today, because th this is actually happening already at the level of many, many HPC centers in Europe, uh, is the fact that quantum computers um, are probably going to be integrated pretty soon in our work, uh, work computing models as accelerators. Originally, there was this idea of mapping a, a, a problem into a computer, universal computer, that would solve it end to end. What we are seeing now is the development of algorithms that instead offload some part of their task to a quantum computer the same way you would to a GPU or, 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 or another accelerator. OK, so in, in uh, accessing quantum, the QPU, the quantum computer, within a broader classical infrastructure, OK? Of course, it's not as easy as uploading to a GPU, <laughs> but it's just for you to understand the connection. So, so if we look at this from a pure computer science application, so let's forget about quantum mechanics. Let's try to translate quantum mechanical effects into computer science things that we need to take into account if you want to build our algorithms, OK? So I, I said. Uh, quantum states exist in a superposition. So this leads to natural, naturally intrinsic, intrinsic parallelism, because a qubit can at the same time represent the, both the zero and the one state. OK, so can we say that this automatically leads to an exponential speed up? Because if I need, uh, if, if I have um, n qubits, I can represent the same amount of information that I could represent with two to the n classical bits. But does this mean that I have an exponential speed up? Unfortunately, we will see that this is not exactly the case. In principle, it is true. But actually, in practice, what happens is that because you need, in any case, to measure a qubit at the end of your, your algorithm, you can indeed process in parallel information on, on a exponentially faster. But this needs to be taken, I mean, but you need to design the algorithm properly, OK? Otherwise, you lose this entirely. In fact, in most of the cases we see today, this is not possible. Then there is the point of entanglement. I didn't talk about that, but this is very important. It's the idea of uh, is the specific nature of quantum correlations that exist and that allow us to map probably to a more complex um, I said here nonlinear correlation. What I meant to say is really more, it's more general than that. It's really, if we have a set of qubit, are they going to be able to represent a much more complex um, uh, topology of correlations than in the classical case if those qubits are entangled? And what is the level of entanglement that I need between my qubits in order to create an object that I cannot reproduce classically? Okay, so this is a uh, this is a very another question that we need to answer when we build those models. Then there is the idea of probably this was, I mean, I, I just very mentioned it very quickly, but basically gates operations in the quantum domain are represented as unitary transformation, unitary matrices. It means that those in principle are completely reversible. Can we say that quantum com computing is actually reversible computing? Not really, because there is the measurement step. But up to a certain level, within before we measure, is it true that? So this is this is uh, important. 
and the measurement itself. The measurement itself is a process that is stochastic in nature. It happens according to the Born rule, and this means that the result of our com uh, computation will be stochastic. So whenever we measure the qubit, a qubit, there will always be a certain probability that we measure it in the zero state or in the one state. So we need to run our measurements many, many times in order to see what is the preferred state or the state we reach with the highest probability. And that would be the result of our calculation. Okay, so this is very important. Then there are more aspects that maybe are not so relevant now for you know the context of quantum machine learning, but they should be kept into account in a broader context. And is everything that has to do with information security, and so the fact that uh, you can't actually clone um, qubit states, the stability. Well, I already mentioned the stability of a computation. How how much can we reproduce it? And the rep reproducibility limitation is it really just a matter of uh, uh, taking errors correctly into account, or is it something more profound that has to do with the measurement step, um, step? Okay, so those are all questions that need to be understood when we build algorithms. So how do we fit in all of this? <laughs> so just very, very briefly, because I want to show you examples and I'm, uh, you didn't see anything yet. Uh, so, so well, CERN is very much engaged in quantum technologies, and just to make this uh, this slide and the next one very brief, what we want to see is to understand how much of of uh, how many aspects of quantum technologies can be used in high energy physics. And I talk about computing, but there's many more. There, there is much more that's related to sensors, that's related to communications, and so on and so forth. But also how much of our technology and our expertise can help improve quantum technologies. Okay, so this is a second, this is a two-sided two uh, coin, if you want. And yes, so QT for HEP and I have for QT, that's fine. Um, and that's why since uh, 2020, we have an initiative that's dedicated to doing exactly that. And I'm happy to say that we just started our second phase now. Initially, we were very much uh, at an exploratory stage. We are now consolidating a few of our results. This is, I think, if you want more information, there is our roadmap that is a public document and it's linked below, but this is really not so much a discussion, I mean, in relevant now. Um, so let me go to quantum machine learning finally. So what do I mean? When I talk about quantum machine learning, I mean about I mean using quantum computers to improve machine learning. Okay, there is also the other way around, okay? We don't talk about that. I'm not talking today about using machine learning to improve quantum technologies. That is a very lively field of research, but it's not what I will show you to show to you now. Um, so, so typically this means, if you look at the, here, at, the, at the table, that's another favorite of a lot of QML speakers, uh, you will see that in most cases, uh, what we are using today is the case in which we are looking into quantum algorithms that are used to analyze classical data. Okay, so this is a tricky part in which we need to understand how we define advantage. We could end up at some point in the situation in which uh, we could use quantum algorithms to, to, to study quantum data. That's not yet the case. Okay, in most cases, this square here at the bottom is represented only by simulations at the moment. So, what is it that we look for when we try to build uh, machine learning using quantum computers? Uh, do we look into trying and, and, and improve on the complexity and the representational power of our models? Do we look into speed up? Do we want to train those algorithms faster? Do we want to train those algorithms using a smaller training samples? Are we already can we already be concerned about energy efficiency? There are the, 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 the answer changes depending on the tasks at the task at end. Okay. Initially, people that were looking into quantum computers were really interested in trying to prove speed up and and and, and you know from a complexity theory theory point of view. That's not necessarily what we want to do in the case of a uh, quantum machine learning. What's important, I would say, is that we are able to evaluate performance on realistic use cases. So uh, you know what is the typical cycle, life cycle of machine learning algorithms. Uh, this is still true also for the for when you want to use quantum computers to build 
or to, to optimize uh, a trainable system, okay? There is a, sta a stage in which you need to do data preparation. This can be more or less heavy depending on how much feature engineering you want to do. So if you're doing deep learning, you probably want to keep this to a minimum. However, this is a very important step in quantum computing because it involves the moment in which you load the classical data on the quantum state. And there are many options for doing that. And the way you do it has an impact on the, on the performance of the algorithms. There's the way you define your algorithm, your model, the trainable model itself. That is the process of training that needs to be studied because you are using very different implementations of your data representations, okay? I will get to it in a moment. The rest is typically something that really looks very much uh, as, as in the classical uh, case. So, so I don't want to go into the details. These slides just were maybe, I mean, I can, we can, we can discuss this in the, in the, in the discussion later if you're interested. But this slide is just meant to show you that. So if I want to run a quantum algorithm, I need to be able to, as I said before, load the classical data on quantum states. So I need to find an optimal way of representing on the, for example, the amplitude of my quantum state. The way I choose to do it as an impact. On, on my on the QML algorithm at the end. You see at the top, the way a classifier, this is a rock curve, the way a classifier, binary classifier uh, performance changes, depending on how I do this. You see at the bottom, also the way in which another CNN-based classifier uh, uh, accuracy changes when I, when I change that. So this is not something that can be easily, or, or let's say blindly solved just by taking into account you know, uh, uh, the, 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 just by mapping the classical data into the best possible, uh, the, the most um, efficient in terms of number of qubits um, algorithm, embedding algorithm. If I talk about models for machine learning, so the, 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 basically what you know about the classical domain maps to the quantum domain, so you have here variational algorithms that correspond to neural network. The idea is that you have a, a classical data that is embedded in quantum states. Then you build a parameterized circuit, so a parameterized quantum set of quantum gates. Then you read out the run on your training data. Then you read out the output. Then you run a classical optimizer that will optimize the parameters that define your quantum gates in the exact same way you would train a classical neural network okay so in this case the quantum algorithm is uh, the quantum implementation is really in the in the data representation okay but the optimization step is classical then there is the uh, the quantum equivalent of classical kernel methods the very well known support vector machine so this is an interesting uh, interpretation because Basically, what you're doing is that you consider the transformation that you need to do in order to load classical data on quantum states, and you say, this is a kernel. This is a feature map. So now that I have this representation in the quantum state, can I use it to, uh, to simplify my task? For example, to find a better separation between two classes. OK, so exact same way as you would for SVM or another nonlinear classifier. And then there is energy-based machine learning, and this is another very natural implementation of machine learning on quantum computers. And here, uh, the, the Boltzmann machines are the typical, uh, typical example. And here, basically, what you do is you represent, you map the energy of a set of qubits as the function, as the, as the, as the, uh, the the function that represents the problem you want to optimize. Okay, and then you look for the energy state, the, the ground state, and so the minimum energy state of your set of qubits. Okay, and this is uh, this is exactly what you would do in the, in the case of the of the Boltzmann machines. Now, conceptually, it's not complex. Okay, what we do classically, we can do on the quantum uh, quantum circuits. In practice, this can have very strong implications on how you actually met or on, on finding out to which extent you can actually make these models converge. In the sense that I didn't really show you in practice how you implement 
or how you map your data on quantum states. But the idea here, obviously, is that you want to create a system, a quantum system, that will give you some kind of advantage with respect to a classical one, right? Otherwise, it wouldn't be worth it. And now, in order to do that, what you might want to do is to use as much as possible the power of the quantum space, which is exponentially large. This can have, and this actually does have, an implication on the trainability of your models. Okay, I will show you a couple of examples for a kernel method and for a classical method, uh, for, a, for a neural network of this, of this uh, trainability issue. Uh, yes. So, so what do I mean by this? So the, the circuit here, it, it doesn't really matter. The, 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 the um, details of the circuits here don't really matter. What the circuit is showing you is a case in which I have uh, events, let's say a set of uh, features, classical features that I want to map to a quantum state. I build my, my embedding. So I load them on my quantum state using, for example, this first part of my circuit. And I've chosen the structure of this circuit so that I'm trying to use as much as possible of the exponential, exponentially large Hilbert space that I that I have that I can use. Uh, now, what happens? And, and I do this for uh, feature X, feature Z, and then I build my 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 kernel. Now, what happens? What what can happen? And we see, in fact, is that. If I use too much of the space um, that my set of qubits represents, so of the upper space, I, I end up in a situation in which my input data becomes very sparse. And this means that although the problem is in principle always uh, supposed to find a unique solution, convergence solutions, because the losses are convex in the kernel method, this is not going to happen because the space that I have to search is actually too large. Okay, so the very same fact that in principle should give me an advantage with respect to classical machine learning is also hurting the trainability of my, of my model. So effectively, I'm sure you are familiar with the concept of projected kernel in classical machine learning. This idea of choosing a lower dimensional space that approximates locally the optimization surface for your kernels. This same concept is something that we can use also in the quantum domain. And, and it's, it's like taking a step back with respect to this very large Hilbert space that it's making our data too sparse. And this actually has a very strong uh, effect on the performance of the, in this case, a classifier. We tested on a, on a binary classification problem inspired by a physics domain. And we do see that indeed, if we just use any kernel, map to the entire space, we are basically going to get, this is, uh, this is uh, the blue curve, we are going to get a 50% prediction error, which basically means we have a random classifier that doesn't learn anything. While when we start to reduce, and, and the red one, by the way, is the classical implementation, which is slightly better, but not great, but slightly better. But when we use projected kernels, then we can improve very much on the performance of our model. Okay, so this is an example of the struggle that you need to solve between uh, quantum, between the idea of looking for quantum advantage, so this aspect that could make the quantum algorithm worth uh, implementing, rather than any classical SVM or other, and the, the, the problems that are related to training. Okay, I'm going to give you another example. Maybe we can skip this. Uh, which is uh, the, the concept of, uh, of gradients, uh, decay, and, and uh, barren plateaus. I'm sure you're also for me very much familiar with this problem in the classical domain. This is also a problem in the quantum domain, in the sense that we do see the quantum gradients that decay exponentially with the size of our problem, with the number of qubits that we are using to map our data, to analyze our data. And so we cannot just build the biggest possible model uh, to solve a certain problem, but we need to be smart about the way we define the loss functions and the way we define the, the topology, so the gate, uh, uh, the topology of the circuit, okay, the choice of the specific operations. And we also need to take into account this problem of the error and the noise that is typical of, of, the, of the hardware, which can have an impact also on the quality 
of the variant on, on the quality, on the size of the variant on our, on our gradient. Let me give you an example, a couple of examples quickly. Uh, maybe we can skip this. Well, no, this is an important thing, not in detail, but I wanted to point out, since I mentioned, um, we still have five minutes, right? Since I mentioned um, the choice, that, that it's important to choose wisely the shape of the circuits, the shape of the, uh, of the, if you want, of the algorithm that we want to train. This is an example of a way of doing it by taking into account the symmetry existing in our data. So let's imagine that you want to analyze a picture. So this picture can be invariant with respect to rotation or reflection. Okay, so you can design your answers, your, your circuit in such a way that you preserve somehow those quantities, those, those symmetries. If you do that, then you are going to end up with algorithms that are much, much easier to train. And in fact, you can see here how, so basically the differences between a non-equivariant, so a standard convolutional neural network, and a convolutional neural network that is aware of the symmetries within the data. And you can clearly see that the loss function, this is a visualization of a, of a loss landscape, gets gets much uh, much better. So as usually I'm late, uh, let me give you a couple of examples because uh, I promised them and we skip this because it's uh, it's a little bit of details. Okay, I'll give you an example about uh, a generative model and then I'll give you an example about anomaly detection. So for 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 uh, generative models are a very interesting topic and and by far, in uh, quantum computers, we are looking at very a, a much simpler model than what you can do classically. Okay, so we are talking about two universes that for now are very far off. We are talking about models that we try to keep as small as possible and that are very targeted to specific tasks. We are not looking yet, we are not there, um, into studying generalization of generative models as you would do for, for classical domain. Okay, I just want to make this clear. But one very important, where very important or, or interesting generative model that exists in the quantum domain is what's called the quantum circuit born machine. Now, the quantum circuit, this was actually introduced. Well, okay, no, I don't have the name, sorry. Um, so, what is it, the quantum circuit born machine? If you are able to train a quantum state, you build a parameterized quantum state, you train it in such a way that your quantum state learn, represents the probability distribution that you are trying to learn. Then I mentioned before that the measurement is a stochastic measurement. It happens through what it's called the Born rules that will give me, that will measure the probability that my measuring a quantum state will yield a certain value, okay, represented by, that, that's, that's, uh, that's represented by the, 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 the PDF that I learned. Okay, so by, by measuring the quantum state, what I'm basically doing is reproducing the same sampling step that you would implement in a generative model. Okay, this is, that's why this is a very simple, a very elegant way of sampling, uh, sampling um, uh, from a probability distribution that a quantum state learned, okay? If you want to be very, very concise. So we try to do this to learn the a multivariate distribution, maybe you can go here. Multivariate distribution, those are three different, uh, different uh, features that represent a particle. They are all correlated with each other. And uh, what we did was to try and, and, and train this model to reproduce them properly and reproduce the correlation among them and get stable result, e results even when run on, on quantum hardware. And this is indeed what we see. Now, if you compare this to the complexity, I would say, of those features with respect to what you would classically do, of course, those look very like very small, um, very simple problems. However, those kind of, uh, of, of um, these kind of, of features were learned by systems that have no more than 10 parameters. Okay, so very, very small. Um, I'm a little late. I will just show you what I mean with anomaly detection. Okay, so we're going to be a couple, uh, couple minutes more. This is an instructive example because it shows 
more or less uh, what is the typical pipeline for using for using uh, um, quantum machine learning experiments on classical data today. So what we do is uh, build a hybrid pipeline in which we have classical data, which has a very high dimensionality typically, because what we are trying to solve is something very similar to what you would do in a real experiment. So you would build a certain number of features, hundreds of features, and then you'd like to analyze them uh, through uh, through uh, our the anomaly detection tool. So what we do, because at the moment we are not yet uh, able to load hundreds of features efficiently on a quantum computer, is to use an um, uh, intermediate classical step for the dimensionality reduction tool. This is typically done by a simple load encoder, which is what you see here, that is trained to give us a reduced representation of the original problem, a set of features that are related to a certain number of particles. And then basically what you do is you use the internal representation of the autoencoder to train a quantum systems that can flag the anomaly. And this can be done either by clustering. And so you can build the equivalent of k-means or k-medians or other uh, clustering algorithms for the quantum domain and the, the equivalent of kernel machines that are trained as anomaly detection tools, so on, on a single class. So what happens if you do that? This gives you the details of what kind of events, but this is more, it's not really important at the moment. Just, just know that what we are doing is we are taking all the 300 features that represent a physics event, and we are scaling it down to four, eight, or, six, or 16. Okay, so about the, that amount. And then what we do is to train a kernel method on a, as a one class SVM. So basically what we do is, is, is a train in maxi maximizing the distance with respect to the origin in the, in the kernel representation of your data. And so we hope that the anomaly falls close to the origin while all the rest is very well separated. And if you do that and you test it on classical models, then you can see that basically what happens is that in spite of the very small size of the, of the um, quantum algorithms, we can do as well or better than the classical cases. Now, better is something that we need to discuss because of course the comparison here is done between a quantum SVM and a classical SVM. And maybe you can decide something, design some other tools that work much better than SVM. Of course, that is not the point of this discussion at the moment. So this is not a plot that claims quantum advantage per se. But what is interesting is the fact that we can link this performance to the quantum um, nature of our algorithms. Okay, So the fact that the quantum SVM is implemented as a set of entangled qubits is actually something that is driving the performance of the algorithm, okay? And I think this is the last thing I'm, I'm going to show you, and uh, we can discuss questions. I'm sure you're familiar, because I was very fast. Okay, thank you so much for this interesting talk. I mean, this is like totally a change of paradigm in the machine learning, so for sure we will hear from this in the future, uh, definitely. So. Yes, now as as usual, like the, the people that want to make questions, they can write their name in the chat and I will uh, coordinate the the turns. And while people uh, digest all this information, uh, I would ask to know to to I would like to ask if like I don't, I'm not sure what is the stage of the of the development of the quantum machines, but how you train these models in what type of, of computers are like the similar computers that we can that we could have at uh, servers or here? So so when we talk about this setup, okay, mm -hmm. so this is a hybrid setup in which you have something like the autoencoder or maybe some other pre-processing step that you can run on your classical machines, can be CPUs, autoencoder, maybe GPUs. But then the idea is that you can run these algorithms on quantum hardware oh, quantum directly. Hardware. Now, most of the studies 
are done in any case on simulators. But when I say uh, classical simulator, what is so classical hardware? That's not the case here. Here we run on quantum, but and also in the board machine example I showed you before. But basically, what happens is that in, at the moment, okay, and I'm not sure this strategy will continue in the future, but at the moment, the research group simulate quantum uh, circuits on classical hardware. Basically, they write the code that emulates the behavior of a quantum gate and of a, quant uh, and of a qubit, and they use it to understand the performance of, a, of an algorithm. Now, the problem with this approach is that, I mean, it simulating quantum hardware requires a huge amount of resources because of what I said before about the exponential size of the quantum space that is, I mean, the size of the quantum space that is exponentially larger. So basically you run out of memory on classical on classical uh, computers or co computing uh, frameworks, whatever, uh, very soon, okay? You, you are not able, no, if you want to re to 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 let's say uh, comfortably uh, simulate few tens of qubits, you need a small cluster already. If you want to go beyond, you need an HPC cluster, and at some yeah. point you are not able to simulate the quantum states anymore. So the idea is that once I mean the problem, if you want, or or, or the inter it depends how you look at it. It's either the problem or the exciting thing. As soon as we are able to run or to design algorithms that are actually requiring hundreds of qubits, we will not be able to simulate them anymore. So we will need to study them natively on quantum computers. And I think this is a very, very, we are approaching that area, that era very, very fast, very quickly. When, when do you estimate that we could uh, run things in native quantum computers? It, computer? it depends if you want to, me to be realistic or no, <laughs> no. If you look at the roadmap, for example, the the, the there are already now systems that uh, that uh, are built with an order of hundreds of qubits. Okay, I'm talking about the big ones like IBM. But IBM is already promising a thousand qubit machine in a year's time. Now, whether we 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 will actually be able to to um, to write algorithms that can run on that kind of hardware in a year's time, this is another question. What are the challenges related to it? That is a very, very, you know, uh, broad uh, set of studies that needs to be done in order to do that. But we are not talking, I mean, we are talking about in a year's time, right? So if mm -hmm. the hardware is available, people will learn how to use it. So the time scale is not so long. Mm. Okay, I don't know if there are questions. Okay, yes. Darren has a question. Uh, I can read it for, for you. And yes. he says, what global challenges are you excited about that you believe will be solved by quantum computing? Wow, okay, global challenges. Uh, I, I, I'm more comfortable in talking about physics than global challenges. <laughs> But if you're talking about quantum machine learning, so quantum, I will give you my personal uh, view of this. Um, I come from the classical machine learning domain. So for me, uh, machine learning as, as a general term, okay? So for me, the class of trainable algorithms is, uh, is the way to go whatever problem you have, okay? It's a very exciting approach to basically everything. And you can see today, artificial intelligence is, the, the level of classical artificial intelligence is such that, uh, you know, then this was also very, very rapid uh, development. So what I would like to see is really a, a moment in which we are confident that using quantum computing, we can further improve on that. But this is not something that is possible today in the sense that there is even some part of the community that doesn't look at QML as one of the algorithms that are most promising for you don't know reaching some sort of advantage now and the reason is that there are many reasons but some of them i mentioned the fact that the very same configuration that are leading to you know an advantage are also the ones that are making it harder to train those algorithms okay trainability generalization what i briefly very very superficially mentioned in this talk and then there are the cases in which it's, it's really the application of qml 
that does of machine learning that doesn't work very well on quantum computers now. The idea of, of processing a large amount of data. This is not something you can easily do on a quantum computer today. So we need a lot of more research and a lot of evolution in the technology before, before we can actually see this uh, solved at a global scale, when we will have an algorithm that can be used to solve many different problems. But that is what I would like to see in the future. Okay. Uh, M. Ice is asking, what particular algorithms are you using for data fusion, uh, given the multiple sources of data of different types? So, so, so that depends. Uh, so we don't look at data fusion in the same way as you would do in other fields. Now, there are a range of different approaches to this, but for now, most of the algorithms are very much more uh, serialized in the sense that you run a step uh, after the other. What happens is that you have these big detectors and you start reconstructing or trying to interpret the data from the inner layers and then you move out. And this can be done either in very sectioned, so, so the, this can be done independently for each one of the subdetectors with minimal interaction or not. There are also more evolved algorithms that uh, are, are closer to what you would consider a flow that try to do this in one step and combine the information from the different detectors, but we do not use data fusion in the way you would, for example, combine uh, detect uh, data from a sensor, uh, I don't know, for Earth observation, for example, from a satellite or, or a physics simulation. That's not something we do in the same ways. It's, it's because the problem is slightly different and also the, historically the approach was never, was never the same. Uh, I don't know if there are more questions. Uh, that the said, maybe, of... sorry, maybe I can add okay. that indeed the, the, the introduction of artificial intelligence, machine learning and deep learning can also help in this way, because now what you can do is to train machine learning models to actually give you some sort of uh, combination. So, so to extract information from a combined set of data of different natures, that maybe it's coming from different sensors, right? different kind of sensors. So that exists. But it's nothing that, again, I can map to uh, standard uh, standard data fusion the way it's used in other fields. So. And also what I wanted to ask if, is uh, mm, the way that you develop uh, quantum uh, algorithms is like uh, taking a, always like taking paradigms from the classic machine learning. For example, mm -hmm. you mentioned uh, uh, super vector machines or deep learning neural network models. I don't know if you are also working in another like pure or not seen before in classic machine learning or it's a very it's it's a great question. So the answer is that most of what happens today is that in the sense that you take a concept or or an approach that exists in classical machine yes. learning and you try to reproduce it in the quantum. And this can happen at different levels, meaning that you can try to build an architecture that has a similar behavior. So I had shown here, for, this is the case, for example, for um, CNN. What was the, here, this one. This is an example of a CNN in a quantum domain. Each one of the boxes here will give you a set of operation that is local. So that happens that, that it's, it's a run on a set of qubits that are close to each other in the same way you would define a filter, basically, then you would have cases in which you run here a measurement. So this corresponds to the, the what's it called, the, in, the, in the CNN, uh, the step in which you throw away some of the, ah, sorry, I missed the name, some of your, of your weights and filters. So, so, okay, sorry, I'm missing the word now. But, but that is the equivalent. Uh, so, so, so those are very different operations that reproduce a similar behavior. So that at the end you have an architecture that is uh, invariant with respect to translation, for example, uh, to, to to space uh, uh, translation. So so that exists. That, then there are models like the Born machine that do not have a classical equivalent. For me, I think that mm -hmm. in order to try and overcome these limitations or this this uh, difficulty, these challenges that are related to building models that can fully profit from the quantum implementation and train at the same time, we need to try and do this natively. So stop it, stop translating from classical. Mm -hmm. I think that would be great. Uh, okay. And now like, 
Uh, M. Ice is asking again, uh, do you believe to your current knowledge that the exponential growth of data in this field will in intersect someday with Moore's law curve? Okay, like, uh, no, I'm not sure I understand the question, meaning that the exponential growth of data, you so this is this relates to the classical? This is no, this is related with that. Uh, he, he, that like doubling of transistors is here, like the computing so capacity the in the in the classical. So, so quantum computers do not follow the Moore's law, okay, because they are based on completely different different uh, uh, paradigm. Now, at the same time, there are engineering limitations or technology limitations that can only make uh, make um, you know a, a quantum chip uh, as I mean big up to a certain size and that contains up to a certain number of qubits and in fact a lot of companies are already IBM for example but others too are already thinking about distributed quantum systems so there are different reasons but similar but but let's say the effect might still be the same now how this relates to I'm not sure whether we can directly draw the comparison with respect to the explosion of data because um in any case right now what we try to do is to work on small samples and in fact as, as i mentioned before the typical workflow is to set up a, a chain in which you have some dimensionality reduction step that is classical, so that then you can optimize the input to your quantum, which is much smaller. So I don't know how this relates actually to the question. Um, no, I think that it's, it's responded. Yes, yes, because he later uh, like add a uh, like yes, like what is the if there is an inter interaction between computational development and data growth? But yes. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure I can answer better than, uh, I, I think it's, I did not quite answer, but I'm not sure I can answer better than uh, than this. And now uh, Darren asks, uh, like, what advice would you give to a PhD student to understand and learn more about quantum computing? Uh, let me show, I, I will, I will, I have a set of uh, certainness that there are a lot of resources online. So a lot of the platforms that I use, software platforms that I use to develop code, do you know also have a lot of tutorials and examples, and they are very informative. And people and you know people newcomers are very easily can can learn very easily, because in any case, uh, um, again this this is very close to the environment of machine learning. All of the coding happens in Python. Uh, that are very similar also interfaces to the different operations. So this is uh, simple. Even at CERN, we have um, we have organized introductory lectures a few years ago about quantum computing and QML. So uh, in the version of the slides that I will uh, maybe share with you, I will add the slide with the list of, um, of those resources so people can have a look. At the moment, it's still, uh, I mean, there are courses, but but uh, the people that, that join these efforts have very different backgrounds. So there are people that are coming from quantum mechanics and physics. There are people coming from computer science, from mathematics. So I would say I would say it's still very varied, very very flexible environment. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, then I think that we are like more than in time, so. Uh... I think that it's time to finish. So thank you so much for your time today. And thank I you. hope to see I hope to see from you soon. <laughs> thank you. And thanks for the question. And also feel free if